We are catching up with a fan favorite here on StansberryInvestor.com. We are speaking with Rick Rule. He is the founder of Rule Investment Media, formerly of Sprott. And uh, it's always a joy uh, to have him on. Uh, Rick, good to see you. I'm not going to ask you if you're enjoying your retirement because you're not retired. You're, you're, you're active more than ever. I don't know about more than active, but I've given up regulated activity and I've given up managerial responsibility. So I've achieved my goal of becoming a very rich and very old adolescent. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to be back on with you, Danielle. I was thinking the other day, we've been doing these interviews for a very long time. Uh, you must've been in diapers when we started, frankly. Uh, uh, not quite, <laughs> not quite, but, but, but long enough, long mm -hmm. enough that we've known each other a long time. And, uh, but you know what? You always surprise me with, with something new. And I thought this is a perfect time to bring you on because as we're speaking, the Fed is meeting um, and they are meeting in the context of, or they're facing right now, higher inflation, I should say. And, and speaking as the Fed balance sheet now tops $8 trillion for the first time. So I said, you know, who can help us make sense of what's going on? Well, the man that called them manic depressive last time we spoke. <laughs> um, how, how do we get out of this mess, Rick? I know it's a very big question to start with, but that's where I'm going to go. Well, let's start by saying any answer that I could give you would be speculative because I don't know how we get out of this. My suspicion is that we get out of this through a combination of what we tried in the 70s, which is to say inflate away the net present value of the obligations, uh, and perhaps uh, politically. Uh, I believe, as we discussed last time, Daniela, that the Fed's in a box. The policies that have gotten them in the box, which is to say quantitative easing, excessive debt uh, with their partners in Congress, deficits, and in particular, uh, low negative real interest rates are extremely popular. <laughs> and it seems that there's a, a lot of political demand for them to do the wrong thing. So <clears throat> Daniela, I, I, I do believe that they're in a box. Most uh, Americans, uh, on the face of it, must be enumerate. The idea that the Fed balance sheet has topped uh, $8 trillion is not a good thing uh, because that asset is matched by a much larger liability. Uh, it's bad, too, because it sends the wrong signals to society. Uh, artificially low interest rates are, among other things, uh, a manifestation of a war on savers who are scarce by spenders who are necessary. Uh, a society can't spend its way to prosperity. It can only save itself to, pro to prosperity. But in a democracy where spenders are numerous and savers are scarce, the war on savers by spenders is extremely popular. <laughs> You'll recall, Danielle, sorry for the long-winded answer. You'll recall in our last interview, uh, I said that the circumstance reminded me of an old Pogo commercial where Pogo was in the swamp. <laughs> and he says, I have met the enemy and he is us. <laughs> so these whole, this whole policy perspective that you and I are discussing today, while it's deleterious to the nation and deleterious to us individually, is very popular. So the Fed really is in a box. That's such a good point you've brought up and one I had not heard before. So I want to focus on that, how it sends a bad message, right? That spend all you want, $120 billion um, bond program every month. You know, what is money? What is paper? What is it worth? Right? Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Right? Artificially low interest rate sends, a, well, it, it sends a bad moral message, which is to say that you don't need to spend. Uh, and that if you don't save, society will save on your behalf by sending you counterfeit money. It does something else too. It distorts the investment landscape. When money is so cheap and so easily available, there is ironically a redistribution of income up the scale. Rich people, frankly, like myself, uh, who have access to credit and understand how the credit markets work, are subsidized uh, by people who don't have access to credit. So ironically, despite the fact that the government is overtly redistributive, which is to say they're trying to steal the wealth of rich people to give to voters. Uh, at the same time, they're promulgating 
um, financial policies that increase the wealth divide by subsidizing capital for people like myself who have access to capital. It's truly a strange world. If you had asked me to, for, to uh, sort of you know, forecast this world 10, 10 years ago, if you had described what we're in the midst of now, uh, I, I would have accused you of flights of fantasy, but here we are. <laughs> here, here we are. And it also, you know, I would argue, kills the value or, or, or notion of, of what is money. Right. And this is why perhaps so many people are looking now and perhaps they hadn't before to alternative assets. And here's my next point to to gold, because I know you wanted to speak a little bit about um, the, the malaise that uh, people are feeling right now surrounding this market and uh, how they want to get back to at least 2000 an ounce and are scratching their heads thinking, why isn't it happening? People need to be very careful what they wish for. Um... Gold does well when people are afraid, uh, in particular, where they're afraid of the ongoing purchasing power uh, of conventional savings instruments. Uh, I suspect that those fears are real and will be realized. Uh, My suspicion is that gold clears 2000 at some point in time handily. Uh, I would urge people uh, not to look forward (laughs) to that circumstance, but rather to view it as a contingency to insure against. Uh, In direct answer to the thrust of your question, if you examine prior gold bull markets, they've been much longer affairs than people believe. Uh, Some of your viewers after our last interview said, uh, Rick, we're three and a half or four years into this gold bull market. Have I missed it? Uh, If you study history, gold bull markets traditionally are decade long affairs. So their duration is much longer than people believe. And their dimension is too. Uh, Again, if you look at the last gold bull market, 2000 to 2011, the gold price increased from $253 an ounce to $1,900 an ounce. So when people say, Rick, gold's already gone from 1,000 to 1,800, have I missed the print? Uh, If one observes history, no. But particularly, I think that viewers need to examine why we're in a gold bull market Uh, because if you examine the reasons for the trend, you know more about the trend. Those are, I believe, quantitative easing, debt and deficits, negative real interest rates, and the very low market share that gold enjoys relative to other asset classes. I don't think those are over. Uh, People say, well, you've been saying the same thing for three and a half or four years. I would say, first of all, yes, and I've been right. (laughs) Uh, But more importantly, the malaise that we're in uh, is consistent with the performance of precious metals and precious metals equities in past bull markets. You can have cyclical declines in a secular bull market and have that bull market still intact. People's expectation of the future is uh, often given by their experience in the immediate past. And the fact that gold hasn't performed for 12 months or so causes people to ignore the reasons for a gold bull market. Right. And such a good point. And, and, and if you could just, when, when did that bull market start for you, Rick? I'm going to suggest that the bull market started, uh, it, well, in my opinion, it would have started 2016, okay. but I think uh, it started popularly in 2000, in late 2017. You began to see the gold quote itself, the metal uh, establish, you know, higher lows and higher highs. So I suspect if one was better at technical analysis than I, uh, that the consensus would be that it started in 2017. What, what, is there anything missing this summer that we saw last summer in the gold market? Yes, we were in the peak of COVID last year. Would you attribute that uh, a lot of um, the gold rally that we saw in August hitting a nominal high of 2000 was surrounding the fear still around? Uh, I, I, th- I thought about that a lot. Yeah. Uh, and my suspicion is that the decline in the U.S. 10-year treasury, the interest yield on the U.S. 10-year treasury uh, from uh, 2017, three and change, down to 60 basis points, was the most important determinant of the gold price. Uh, and the fact that the Fed, uh, if you will, took a break in terms of yield management and allowed the 10-year treasury to increase from 60 basis points to 175 basis points, uh, I think was responsible for 
the hiatus in the gold bull market. The same way that the same policies uh, were responsible for the hiatus in the gold bull market in 1975. It was eerily similar. One of the reasons why I think gold gets back on track sooner rather than later is that they uh, have now brought the US 10 year rate down to 120 basis points at the same time that the indicated rate of CPI inflation is 4.5%. Uh, there is nothing uh, more stark in arithmetic terms than getting paid 1.2% in a currency that's depreciating by 4.5%. The US 10 year treasury is a profoundly bad savings instrument. And that's what gold uh, is competing with. And my suspicion is that that arithmetic will prompt, uh, as it did last year, disintermediation from various conventional savings products into gold and gold equities. Now, I think sooner rather than later. That is such a beautiful thesis. Excellent point. Uh, thank you for that, Rick. Um, getting back to the Fed and what I mentioned at the start and how do we stop this vicious cycle? <clears throat> how afraid are, look, my, let me rephrase that question. How concerned do you think the Fed is? Do you think Jerome Powell is looking at inflation? I is, do. I do. And is, and is fearful of it, scared of it, run away? Yeah. I, I mean, while I don't like these people, Daniela, uh, I respect them. I think they're smart people. But they're in a political box. Uh, we're in a market right now, I believe, where liquidity is a substitute for solvency. What do you do if you're the Fed? Uh, what do you do when you look at the on-balance sheet liabilities of the U.S. government at $28 trillion and, and the off-balance sheet liabilities, entitlements, uh, that exceed $120 trillion? What do you do when you're $150 trillion upside down and you service those obligations with a federal budget that's in deficit $3 trillion a year? What they are doing is they are substituting liquidity, uh, stimulus, for solvency. They're forestalling the problem and hoping somehow, magically, that we can grow our way out of this. They tried it in the 70s. Uh, one of the things that they did in the 70s is that they deliberately allowed inflation to run to reduce the net present value of the obligations. Uh, in other words, if the dollar falls by 50%, <clears throat> those debts are more serviceable because you're paying back depreciated principal. It's a very, uh, you know, it's a very ugly, very cynical thing to do, but I think they see themselves as having no other choice uh, politically. So continuing with a low interest rate environment as most economists project, I mean, could they do a, 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 just a, re a reversal and start hiking interest rates? We know they could, but would they? Uh, that's what I would prefer, uh, but you would have a very ugly reckoning, Daniela. If you reverted to mean in, in terms of interest rate markets, uh, traditionally the mean yield on the US 10 year has been positive. So it's been maybe 150 basis points positive. If you took the Congressional Budget Office estimate of inflation at 4.5%, and then tacked on 150 basis points to get a real yield, that means that the yield on the US 10-year treasury would be at 6%. Uh, traditionally, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate has been 100 or 150 basis points above the 10-year treasury yield. So you would take the 30-year fixed mortgage rate from 3% to 7%. Um, that would certainly make <laughs> uh, housing affordable. <laughs> in the sense that prices would fall, uh, but maybe less affordable in the sense that people couldn't afford their mortgage. I'm not sure that the economy as we see it could stand uh, the Fed getting out of the way uh, of uh, interest rates. Uh, I mean, that's precisely what Volcker did. Uh, Volcker broke the back of inflation by raising the cost of capital or allowing the cost of capital to rise, pardon me, he didn't cause it to rise, he allowed it to rise, to the extent that the cost of capital uh, eliminated inflationary pressures in the economy. It did so uh, at the expense of millions of jobs temporarily and, and 
maybe uh, in 1981 or 1982, you were less aware of the economy than, <laughs> than I was. Uh, but it was certainly a challenging time. Millions of people lost their homes, uh, that type of thing. Uh, you know, we had a real reckoning, and I don't think we have the political will in the country now to have a reckoning. That said, Rick, uh, let's talk sectors that Mr. Rick Rule, um, I know you hate the word Mr., that Rick Rule <laughs> is looking at right now. Uh, offline, we're talking about oil at 60 bucks. Let's start with that one. Um, is that I a mean, play you're looking at? Yeah, I... I I sort of believe that uh, oil uh, in the longer term holds above $60. I'm not trying to say it couldn't fall to 40 or something in the interim, but the oil industry is focused on free cash flow, not on sustaining capital investments, which means that we're going to continue to have supply shortages from time to time. The big thinkers, notwithstanding, uh, you know, the world's not going to be driving Teslas anytime soon. Uh, and at $60, uh, WTI, there's pretty good margin in the oil business now. Uh, the oil companies, by my reckoning, are discounting $45 or $50 oil. And if we hold 60, which I think we're going to do, uh, I think that the oil companies, by most conventional valuation metrics, but in particular, net present value, where you take the estimated uh, future cash flows at certain oil prices and compare them with the enterprise value of the company. By those metrics, the oil companies are very cheap. Uh, the Canadians uh, are the cheapest that I follow for good reason. You know, the prime minister of the country and the Laurentian elites are anti-oil. That notwithstanding, I suspect that they've discounted uh, the political risk of a federal government that's anti-oil. So the mid-tier Canadian oil producers, uh, I think are cheap. Uh, I think, too, for uh, American and international investors, the very high quality uh, major integrated uh, American names like Exxon and Chevron for income oriented investors uh, are cheap as well. I wouldn't go overboard in them because you, know, you, you always have a chance of a political backlash. You have some political risk in oil, but I think the sector is fundamentally cheap. I think, too, and I, I hate to beat this uh, dead horse. Uh, well, not a dead horse. But let's just call it a beaten horse. Uh, precious metals and precious metals equities. I think we're pretty close to the end of the malaise as a consequence of the disparity uh, between the CPI stated rate of inflation and the interest yield on other products. Uh, I think if you get some leadership in the gold price that you will see follow through in the precious metals equities, particularly again, in the mid caps. Um, it has been my experience too, Daniela, that uh, in the latter half of gold, with precious metals bull markets, that leadership begins to switch from gold to silver uh, and finally into the silver equities. And I think that investors probably, if they switched into the silver equities now, might be as much as a year early. But for those investors who can take the time risk, uh, my experience has been that the late cycle moves in the silver equities uh, dwarf for speculators any other asset class available to precious metals investors. Uh, finally, I, I would point out to your uh, viewers uh, that things that are least popular are usually the best buys. And, and I would point people in that regard to thermal coal. Uh, all the big thinkers hate coal. coal. Biden hates coal. Trudeau hates coal. Merkel hates coal. The World Economic Forum hates coal. But around the world, when people flip the switch, they want the lights to come on, uh, which means <laughs> that they like coal. The highest year of coal demand on record was 2020, but it will be eclipsed by 2021. The big thinkers notwithstanding. I'm not suggesting necessarily that people go out and buy a basket of coal stocks, but I am suggesting that they condition their thinking to... Uh, Businesses where the arithmetic was better than the narrative. Glencore very recently bought some thermal coal assets, uh, saying that they didn't think there was going to be a thermal coal business in 30 years. But they bought these assets for a one and a half year payout. Uh, there are 600 coal plants worldwide under construction. It's pretty clear that this is going to very have a very happy ending for Glencore. Uh, and, and I think that you know people need to, if they're resource investors, think about commodities that are out of favor rather than in favor. There's a lot of good nuggets in there. 
that you just said. So I hope the folks at home are paying close attention. Uh, Rick, a big part of our last discussion, uh, last time we spoke was surrounding how cash and how you felt you had to be in cash to survive these times. It's so ironic, Daniela. You know, uh, the truth is that if you own cash now, in conventional savings products, you're getting 50 basis points in a currency that's depreciating by 450 basis points, which means you're losing 4% a year. But I think you have to do it. Uh, think of the negative interest rate as an option premium. In my experience, uh, maybe every 10 years, every 15 years, you have a crisis in confidence. You have a liquidity crisis. And the price of everything sells off. Uh, the last really good one we had was 2008. Uh, I use good advisedly, of course, because many of your listeners got hurt in 2008. But in the 2008 crisis, if you had the cash and the courage, I had both. Uh, 2009 turned out to be an extraordinarily good year for you. So going into a circumstance where there is no liquidity, except you have some, means that you get to take advantage of the situation rather than being taken advantage of by the situation. Uh, so uh, ironically, having large cash balances gives you the tools to deal with the volatility that I see as being absolutely inevitable in these markets. Uh, many of your listeners uh, will think, uh, because perhaps a lack of familiarity with prior cycles, that if they have gold stocks, that they'll do okay in a precipitous decline. Uh, in, in the near term, they won't. Uh, in a precipitous decline, the sell decision isn't made by the investor, it's made by the margin clerk. Uh, and he or she will sell anything that has a bid, uh, which means that even inflation hedges, even catastrophe hedges in the very near term fall in price. And these falls are unnerving. What comes back, however, are good assets. Uh, and people need to acquaint themselves with that too. The reason for that soliloquy was simply to say that holding gold stocks is not the same as holding cash. Uh, in a liquidity crisis. Holding gold, maybe. Uh, I consider myself that gold is good if volatile liquidity. Beautifully versed, Rick. Uh, you are the poet of the industry. I have to say, last thought, bring it home with this, because we can always count on you for some words of advice, encouragement, call it whatever you want um, for, for our viewers watching. Well, I... Uh, I think the circumstance is that uh, as a society, we find ourselves in a very strange place. And I think that the way that society gets out of this is for every individual to look after himself and herself. I, I'm not saying that you don't make provisions for those who uh, can't make provisions for themselves, but don't be a burden on society. Don't spend more than you earn. Don't count on society paying you benefits that it can't afford to pay you. Remember that in American society, before, fed, before uh, state and local debt, that our government owes $150 trillion. If you believe as a young person that you are gonna be afforded a, a gracious retirement on social security, you are wrong. If you believe that we the people are gonna support you in your dotage in terms of healthcare, you are wrong. Uh, you need to take care of yourself. And frankly, if everybody took care of themselves, we wouldn't have a collective problem. You know, make sure that you are able to look after you and yours. It's not society's duty to do that. It's been lovely that we've been in a situation for 50 years when society could, but the bill for all that has come due. Right. Um, and we can't all come and crash at Rick Rule's house. <laughs> you can. Okay. <laughs> um, Rick, uh, on a lighter note, are you having a good summer? I'm having a wonderful on summer. Uh, yeah, I'm having a wonderful summer. We've completed this beautiful house that you see in the background. Uh, the Pacific Northwest weather this summer has been absolutely sublime. Uh, retirement, which for me is a redirection, has meant that I'm doing lots of what I like and not very much of what I don't like. Good. good. Uh, every now and then I amuse myself by talking to you, not frequently enough, but life is very good. Thank you. Come on every week if you want. My final question is I got too many comments. People are like, you need to ask Rick Rule, what is that collection of helmets behind you? The uh, helmet collection is a, they're World War I helmets. And they were collected by my great grandfather. The wow. spiky parade helmets that you see were purchased, uh, although for nominal sums, at the end of World War I, there was a liquidity shortage in Germany. 
But the other helmets, uh, the combat helmets, were in fact collected on the battlefield from people who, let's just say, no longer needed them. No, oh, very, very, very cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. And of course, thanks for your, your insights, your time. This is a gift, a true gift for our viewers. I appreciated it. Thank you so much, Rick. Well, I enjoy it. Thank you too for taking the time and effort to uh, uh, ask me uh, good questions that reflected your knowledge of my work. I really appreciate that. I respect your work tremendously. Come back anytime to stansburyinvestor.com. And I hope you all are enjoying our summer series. We'll have more great guests. Oh, that reminds me, Daniela. May yeah. I make my may I make my offer? Absolutely. Well, wait, maybe not. I'm afraid, but go ahead. <laughs> well, my offer is the same as last one. Any of your listeners or viewers who care about uh, my specific thoughts on natural resources can get them by going to a website, sproutusa.com forward slash rankings uh, and entering your natural resource stocks on the web form. Please no crypto. Uh, please no pot stocks. Please no technology stocks. <laughs> I'll rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. I'll comment on individual issues where I think my comments might be of use. And in addition, if you include charts uh, in the comment section, I will send you the Barron's Gold Mining Index chart that we talked about today. And I'll send you a hundred year commodity chart that talks about just how cheap industrial commodities like oil are relative to other asset classes wow. going back a hundred years. SproutUSA.com forward slash rankings. How do you handle all those requests? We have a, a database with about 800 companies that we update. And so the requests are automatically populated. Uh, the comments uh, are uh, where appropriate entered manually. Uh, wow. And to the extent that we can, if people respond, we try to answer questions individually. Thank you for that. That's, that's awesome. Um, go check it out. And thank you again, Rick. And thank you all for watching our summer series. We'll have more great guests like Rick coming up for you. Uh, in the meantime, uh, don't forget to sign up free at DanielaCombone.com for premier access to videos and special offers you won't get anywhere else. That's it for me. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm Daniela Cambone.